Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you back to the End Time Seminar. Tonight we're on session six out of eight. Um, our main topic for tonight is going to be three distinct periods, and we're going to take a look at that tonight. Um, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, again, um, all the sessions do build upon one another, so it would be helpful if you watched the sessions prior to this. In session one, we did an introduction to the end times. We took a jet tour through the book of Revelation, and we looked at three views of the millennium. In session two, we talked about the importance of the book of Daniel. In session three, we looked at four views of the rapture. In session four, we, talk about, we talked about the day of the Lord. And last uh, session, session five, we did a chronology of events from the 70th week. Um, I do have a few folks I'd like to thank again. I'd like to thank Ted Larson for his amazing images from both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. I'd like to thank Pat Smith for her wonderful images from Revelation. I'd like to thank Duncan Long, Peter Olson, Nicholas Pena, and the artists of Good Salt. All of these folks allowed me to use their images, and I'm very appreciative of that. And again, I'd like to thank Albert Sharpie. He's the author of this book called The Return, and he's allowed me to use some of his wonderful end times charts. Now, you'll remember from session one that I put this verse up. Um, Luke wrote this in the book of Acts. Luke said, The Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness. And then he said they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So from the beginning, I've encouraged you to do that, and I hope that you're doing that. I really want you guys to dig into your Bibles, and I want you to check everything that I'm putting up here to see if what I'm saying is true, okay? All right, well, last week we kind of looked at a chronology of events of the, of the 70th week, and we went all the way back to the beginning of the 70th week, and we looked at the seals. We looked at the seals from the book of Revelation, and we saw that when Jesus opens the first seal, the Antichrist arrives on the scene. Remember, he's going to arrive on the scene at the beginning of the 70th week. He's going to do what nobody else has been able to do. He's going to solve that Middle East peace crisis. So there will be some peace in the Middle East, at least for a short period of time. When Jesus broke the second seal, we saw the rider on the red horse. So that was war. So we don't know how long that peace is going to last, whether it's one year or two years, or, you know, it's going to be whatever time God decides. But then after that, there's going to be a period of war. When Jesus broke the third seal, we had the rider on the black horse, and that was famine. And so, of course, after you have a period of war, you're going to have famine. And then with the rider on the fourth horse, the pale horse, we had death. So we talked about these last week, and we talked about they were moving along that time frame. When we got to the fifth seal, we saw that specifically here we have Christian death. Uh, the Apostle John tells us that when Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who've been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. When we get to the fifth seal, this is Christians being killed now. And again, this is happening right around the midpoint. Okay, now we know this isn't the day of the Lord because we're told that we don't face the day of the Lord. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. He said that God has not destined us for his wrath. All right, so we have in the fifth seal, we have Christians being killed. And since the fifth seal martyrs are Christians being killed, we know this can't be the day of the Lord because God's not killing his own children. Now, again, many of the Christians who hold to the pre-trib uh, rapture, most of the Christians who hold to that pre-trib rapture, they believe that God's wrath is poured out for that entire seven-year period. All right? Or they'll say that the day of the Lord starts here and it lasts for the entire seven years. But as we talked about the last couple of weeks, we have a little bit of a scriptural problem with that because God told us he's going to give us a sign before the day of the Lord. And the sign God said he was going to give us is that the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. But as we go to the scriptures, we don't have any passages in the Bible that have the sun, moon, and stars going dark at the beginning of the 70th week. We just don't have any passages in the Bible that support that. They're just not there. All right? Now, again, many people who hold to that view um, will still believe that the day of the Lord starts over there. Let me give you an example here again. This is from Dr. Ron Rhodes' book. And again, I have great respect for Dr. Ron Rhodes, but we just disagree on this. And you notice he said this in his book. He said, most prophecy experts believe the day of the Lord is properly placed after the rapture, right here after the rapture, in conjunction with the beginning of the tribulation period. So again, he holds to the view that the day of the Lord starts over here. But the problem is we don't have any passages that support that. There are no passages in the Bible that have the sun, moon, and stars going dark at the beginning of the 70th week. Um, a little bit later in the book, he says this. He said, scripture typically points to the entire tribulation period as constituting the day of the Lord. And then he says the day of the Lord includes the first six seal judgments. So with his view, all those seal judgments that I just showed you, he says those are the day of the Lord. And those are God's wrath, okay? But again, we don't have any passages that show that the day of the Lord starts over there. Now, there are some Christians who've looked at this, who hold to that view, and they said, you know what? The day of the Lord can't be over there. The passages just aren't there. So they've acknowledged that the day of the Lord has to start over here. And we saw that the day of the Lord is actually, the sign of the day of the Lord is the sixth seal. 
Remember when Jesus breaks the sixth seal, that's when the sun, moon, and stars go dark. So there are some Christians that hold this view that said, no, we understand the day of the Lord can't start there. It has to start over here. Um, one of those is John MacArthur. John says this. He said, the previous five seals will be precursors to the full fury of the day of the Lord, which begins with the sixth seal. So you can see again that among Christians who hold this view, they don't even agree on whether these seals are God's wrath or not. John MacArthur says, no, the day of the Lord can't start till the sixth seal. But as I showed you, some Christians like Ron Rhodes and stuff still believe that the day of the Lord is over there. Okay, well, the fifth seal martyrs again are Christians being killed. So it seems like this can't be the day of the Lord because God's not going to martyr his own children, right? We haven't arrived at the sixth seal yet. And the sixth seal is where the sun, moon, and stars go dark. So that we know is the sign of the day of the Lord. But right now we're only up to the fifth seal. So we have Christians being killed right here at or around the midpoint. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, then what is taking place at the midpoint? If it's not God's wrath, what is it that's going on over here? Well, quite a bit's going on over here, right? We're told by the Apostle Paul that the Antichrist is going to oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And the Antichrist is going to take his seat in the temple and he's going to declare that he himself is God. Remember, Daniel told us in 927 that that's going to happen right here at the midpoint. We also have this other beast, the false prophet. And uh, he, he um, comes up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spoke like a dragon. We're told he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. The false prophet exercises all the authority of the Antichrist. And he's going to make those on the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. So the false prophet's going to make people worship the Antichrist. And we're told he's going to perform great signs. He's even going to make fire come down out of heaven in the presence of men. He's going to deceive those who dwell on the earth because of the signs he was able to perform. And we're told that he's going to uh, make those who dwell on the earth make an image to the beast. And then again, we're told that the beast had the wound of the sword and came to life. It appears that it's going to be a fake resurrection. But we're told that the false prophet is going to cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast to be killed. If you do not worship the Antichrist at this time, then they're going to go after Christians and you're going to be killed. So again, the fifth seal martyrs, they're not killed by God's wrath. That's clearly not God's wrath, right? The fifth seal martyrs are killed by the Antichrist and by his forces, okay? All right, so the question comes up then, well, where's God's wrath? Well, the apostle John tells us where it is. It's at the sixth seal. John says, when Jesus broke the sixth seal, that's where the sun, moon, and stars go dark. The sun, moon, and stars go dark right here, somewhere in the second half of the 70th week when Jesus breaks the sixth seal, right? And Jesus said, then the sky is going, or John tells us the sky is going to be split apart, right? The universe is going to be dark. Jesus is going to come back in power and great glory. And look what happens here. We're told that the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man, John's telling us that all the people of the earth, the unbelievers, look what they're going to do at this time. They're going to hide themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They're going to run and hide. And we're told why. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. You see, the unbelievers of the world are going to be running and hiding at this time because they recognize what's happening here. That sky just peeled back. Jesus came in power and great glory. We're told they can see the presence of him who sits on the throne. And look what they say. They say, hide us from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. The wrath of God and the wrath of his son has come and God's wrath comes right here. This is God's wrath right here. It is not God's wrath over here. That's why they're running to hide here. They weren't running to hide over here. Okay, very important. So again, where is God's wrath? Well, the Bible tells us that the first mention of God's wrath is after the sixth seal because that's the sign God promised to give us. Remember, in the Old Testament prophets, God told us that the sun, moon, and stars would go dark. Joel told us that would happen before the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord starts over here sometime in the second half of the 70th week after the sixth seal is broken, right? That's the sixth seal. The sun, moon, and stars go dark, and it happens over here. All right, so that's why the unbelievers are hiding, right? They're hiding in the mountains. They said, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. God's wrath starts over here. Well, that leads us again to what about this wrath? If God's wrath doesn't start till over here after the sixth seal, what is going on here at the midpoint? Whose wrath is that? Well, we're not left with the mystery here. Going back to the book of Revelation, remember what the apostle John said? Um, John said, she gave birth to a son, a male child who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron and the child was caught up to God in his throne. So she gave birth to a son. Who gave birth to his son? 
Israel gave birth to a son, this son, right? Israel gave birth to Jesus. He's the one who's going to rule all the nations and he was caught up to God in his throne. But then we're told that the woman fled. Israel's going to flee into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. We're told that God's going to protect some of the Jews. Starting here at the midpoint, God's going to protect some of the Jewish people for 1,260 days. That comes out to three and a half years. All right, so the Jewish people, some of them are going to flee. Here's why they're going to flee, because the Antichrist is going to set himself up in the temple. He's going to declare himself to be God. He's going to start going after Jews to kill them. And when he can't kill all of them, he's going to go after the Christians. Now, Jesus warned us about that, right? Jesus said, when you see this, when you see the Antichrist, and Jesus calls him the abomination of desolation. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation that I told you about through Daniel, when you see him in the holy place, Jesus said, flee. You need to get out of there because then there's going to be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world now and never will be. So again, the woman's going to flee, which is exactly what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, when you see the Antichrist go into the temple, get out of there because he's going to start killing Christians. Now, notice the very next verse. Let me back up again. That was Revelation 12, 5, and 6. The Jewish people are going to flee. God's going to protect some of them. I want you to notice the very next verse. There was a war in heaven. That's an amazing verse. Because again, when we think about heaven, we don't normally think about war. Well, we're told there's a war in heaven at this point, and we're told who's fighting. Michael and his angels were waging war with the dragon. The archangel Michael and his angels are fighting with the dragon, and we're told that the dragon and his angels waged war, but they weren't strong enough. Satan and his angels fight back, but they're not strong enough. There was no longer a place found for them in heaven. So the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. This is an amazing passage of scripture right here. We're told that at this point, Satan himself is literally going to be cast out of heaven. Right now, Satan still has access to heaven. Remember, he's allowed to go up to heaven right now. He accuses us of our sin. We're told he's the accuser of the brethren. Peter tells us that sometimes he roams around down here on planet earth, seeking like a lion to see who he he can devour. But Satan can only be in one place at one time. He's not omnipresent like God. So at the midpoint, Satan will be permanently kicked out of heaven. And he comes down to earth. He literally comes down here. Now notice what John says. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. The residents of heaven are going to rejoice because they realize that Satan just got kicked out of heaven and he's not coming back. But John says, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. When Satan literally gets kicked out of heaven and comes down to earth, we're told he has great wrath. He is furious because he knows he has only a short time, right? He only has this much time. He has from the midpoint up until the time that Jesus decides to cut the great tribulation short, right? Now, it could be a little bit shorter than that. It could be a little bit longer. Jesus doesn't tell us exactly where that point's going to be. He just tells us he's going to cut those days short. Well, look what the dragon does. Look what Satan does when he comes down. When he saw that he was thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman. He goes after Israel first, but the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so she could fly in the wilderness to her place where she was nursed for times, times, and half a time from the presence of the servant. So God tells us again that the Jewish people are going to be protected for a time, times, and half a time. That's one year, two years, and a half year. That's three and a half years. God refers to this period of time three ways. Sometimes he calls it 42 months. It's three and a half years. Sometimes he calls it 1260 days. And here he calls it a time, times, and a half a time. All right, so the Jewish people are going to flee because Satan's going to go after them. Now look what happens next. Satan was enraged with the woman. He was enraged with Israel, but he couldn't get to all of them. So we're told he went to make war with the rest of her children. Well, who's that? Well, it's those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, those who hold to the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus are Christians, right? So when he can't get all the Jewish people, he starts to go after the Christians. And here's how he's going to do it. We're told that the dragon is going to give the Antichrist his power, his throne, and great authority. Satan himself is going to empower the Antichrist. And then we're told that the Antichrist is going to make war with the saints and overcome them. So Christians are going to be killed at this time, right? And that's what John was talking about with the fifth seal. He said, when Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. These are Christians being killed. At the fifth seal, these are Christians being killed by the Antichrist. So this cannot be the day of the Lord. Again, God's not killing his own children. We see that these Christians are being killed by the Antichrist. 
So this is the wrath of the devil at this point. Right here when Christians are being killed, this is the wrath of the devil. He gets kicked down to earth and he has great wrath knowing that he has only a short time, right? So this is not the wrath of God. And again, I asked you this question last week. Does God martyr his own children? Does God kill his own children? Well, of course not. God's not going to martyr his own children. All right, so we can see that the great tribulation begins at the midpoint, right? Satan gets kicked out of heaven. He empowers the Antichrist. The devil has come down having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So again, he only has that much time, or possibly it's that much time, or maybe it's this much time. We don't know exactly how much time that will be. But we do know that Jesus said he's going to cut those days short. Remember, Jesus said he's not going to let the great tribulation run for the whole three and a half years. Because he said if he did, none of you would survive, right? Jesus said, for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So the devil has a short time. And we're told that he's going to, uh, the dragon, the devil is going to empower the Antichrist, and give him his throne and great authority. The Antichrist is going to make war with the saints and overcome them. So here's what I really want you to catch. The great tribulation is not the wrath of God. The first part of this second half, and again, we don't know how long this is going to be, but the great tribulation starts right here at the midpoint when Satan gets kicked out of heaven. He empowers the Antichrist who sets himself up in the temple and declares himself to be God. That starts the great tribulation, Jesus told us. But the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. This is the wrath of Satan, right? The first part of this second three and a half years, that's the wrath of Satan right there. Now, we don't know how long that's going to last. Again, it could last that long. But Jesus said, until those days, unless those days were cut short, no one would survive. Now, again, Jesus tells us how he's going to cut these days short. He's going to break the sixth seal. And when Jesus breaks the sixth seal, that's when the sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark, right? So the sixth seal is the sign that God promised to give us before the day of the Lord. The sun, moon, and stars goes dark right here. That's the sixth seal. That's the sign that God promised he would give us before he pours out the day of the Lord. Folks, God just lays this out. I really believe that God just lays this out like breadcrumbs. And if we just follow this, it just all fits, right? So the fifth seals, martyrs, those are Christians being killed. They're not being killed by God because God's wrath hasn't started yet, right? This all goes together just like pieces of a puzzle when we let the scripture interpret itself. Now, as we come to the seventh seal, remember there's silence in heaven for a half hour. Heaven goes completely silent. There's not a sound in heaven. This is pretty amazing. Not a single sound in heaven. Not a sound from the four living creatures. Not a sound from the angels. Not a sound from the 24 elders. Not a sound from the raptured church. Nobody's making any noise. It's completely silent. Why? Well, I think a reasonable answer here is because these inhabitants of heaven, they know what's about to take place next. This is about to take place next. God is going to literally start to pour out his wrath upon this earth. It's a time period that we've seen is called the day of the Lord. And God said this to the prophet Zephaniah. God said, I'm going to bring distress on men. And they're going to walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. And God said their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver or their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Money's not going to do you any good on the day that the Lord comes back to carry out his wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. I want you to look at that latter part of that again. We're told that during the day of the Lord's wrath, during that time period when God comes back to pour out his wrath, God is going to make a complete end, a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of this earth. And in context, he's talking about the sinners. There is coming a day when God is literally going to remove every sinner from the face of this planet. And we're told here that he is going to, the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. God is going to burn this place up. And we're going to see that over the next couple of weeks where God tells us that. Now, this isn't a real popular message today. But folks, this is literally going to happen. God's wrath is coming. This world is on a collision course with its creator. And the sad news is most of the 7 billion inhabitants of this planet are completely unaware that this is headed their way. God is very patient, very loving. He says he doesn't want anyone to perish. But there will come a day, the day of the Lord, when God says, I've had enough. And I'm coming back to reclaim my planet. And I'm going to burn this one up. So this is coming. And God tells us how he's going to do it. God's wrath is going to start with the seven trumpets. John said, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets, and the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. So the sixth seal is the sign of the day of the Lord, right? That's the warning that God said he would give us, that the sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark, but the actual day of the Lord isn't going to start till after the seventh seal is broken. 
And this, again, this just all goes right in order if we just allow Scripture to interpret itself. Now, last week we did a little bit of that where we allowed Scripture to interpret itself. I showed you a chart here from uh, Alan Kirshner's book called Antichrist Before the Day of the Lord. And again, I would really recommend this book to you. I think it's one of the best books out there on, that's biblically accurate on the end times. The subtitle is What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Return of the Lord. Now, in this book, um, on page 179, Alan has a chart showing the parallels between Jesus and Paul, between what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 25 and what Paul said in First and Second Thessalonians. And again, I'm not going to go through all 30 of those parallels because we'd be here all night, but last week I showed you a few of those parallels. Um, two of them were from Matthew 24, verse 30. Um, Jesus said he's going to come with the clouds in power and great glory, which is the same thing the Apostle Paul said. Here's those passages. Jesus said he's coming in the clouds, and Paul said Jesus is coming in the clouds. And Jesus said he's coming with power and great glory. And Paul said for those who don't know Jesus, they'll pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. So they're both talking about Jesus coming in power and great glory. So we see those two parallels. All right. Then in verse 31, we saw three parallels. An angelic presence, the trumpet call, and the gathering. Um, Jesus said he's going to send forth his angels. And the apostle Paul said Jesus is going to descend with the sh shout, the voice of the archangel. He said the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So they're both talking about the Jesus coming with angels, right? The next thing we're going to see is the trumpet call. Um, Jesus said he's going to send forth his angels with the great trumpet. And Paul said the same thing. The Lord will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead will, and Christ will rise first. They're both talking about the trumpet call. And then the amazing one is the third one, the gathering, all right? Jesus said he's going to send his angels. They're going to gather together his elect. The apostle Paul said that those who, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord in the air. That's a gathering. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul said, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. These are two passages where Paul's talking about the rapture. These are indisputable rapture passages. And Jesus is saying the same thing. They're both talking about a gathering, right? So again, they both say it's going to happen in the sky and in the air. We see perfect harmony between Jesus and the apostle Paul, which is exactly what we would expect. So these two passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, those are indisputable rapture passages, and Jesus is saying the same thing. Jesus and Paul are in perfect harmony, which is exactly what we should expect from the Bible, right? We should expect that if Jesus says something, that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John would be in perfect harmony with him. That's exactly what we see. All right, now what I want you to do is I want you to just weigh this for yourself. Remember I told you that I'm not here to try to convince you to believe what I believe. I want you to always examine the scriptures for yourself, weigh these things out, and just see if you think these things are true. All right, so what I'd like to do now tonight, I'd like us to take a look at the parallels between the seals in Revelation 6 and the timing giving by Jesus in Matthew 24. We just now looked at the parallels between the Apostle Paul and Jesus. And what I want us to do now is see the parallels, again, between the Apostle John and Jesus. And I want to see, we're going to look at those seals, and we're going to compare that to the timing given to us by Jesus himself, okay? And again, we're going to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture. Fair enough? Okay, here we go. It all goes together like pieces of a puzzle. So we're going to Matthew 24. This is the Olivet Discourse. And we're told that when Jesus left the temple, he was walking away. And his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. And Jesus said, do you see all these things? He said, I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left upon another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus was letting know that that temple was going to be destroyed. And it must have been quite shocking to the apostles. This was a beautiful building. And Jesus said, do you see all this? It's all going to be torn down. All right. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And they said, tell us, when will this happen? And then they said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Well, take a look at that again. They asked Jesus a really important multi-part question. They said, when will be this, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that's Matthew 24, 3. And I want you to notice the very next verse. The very next verse, we're told that Jesus answered them. And that's who our God is. Our God is wants us to know. So Jesus didn't say, gentlemen, it's none of your business, right? They asked Jesus a very, very important question. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered them. And look at the first thing that came out of Jesus' mouth. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. He said, many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. It's the first thing Jesus told him. Now look what John said in Revelation 6. John said, when the lamb opened the first of the seven seals, right, we get the rider on the white horse. One of the living creatures said, come. We have the rider on the white horse. The rider held a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. Now, remember I shared with you last week that 
Most theologians believe this rider on the first horse is the Antichrist. Notice he has a bow but no arrows. Because when the Antichrist first arrives on the scene, he's not going to appear to the world that he's the Antichrist. I mean, who's going to sign a deal with a guy that says, hey, I'm the Antichrist, right? When he first comes on the scene, he's going to win people over by diplomacy, right? He appears to be, he's going to be very charismatic. He's going to do what nobody else has ever done. He's going to solve that Middle East peace crisis. In other words, he's going to be the great deceiver. And Jesus said, watch out that you don't get deceived, right? Now, we know what he's going to do at the midpoint. At the midpoint, the Antichrist, the beast, is going to set himself up in the temple and declare himself to be God. It's at that point that people will realize that they made a big mistake. That this is the Antichrist, but he's not going to appear that way when he signs that peace treaty. Israel's not going to sign a peace treaty with somebody they think is going to turn on them. So notice what Jesus said. People are going to say, I'm the Christ. Wow. This man's going to be the one who's going to make the ultimate statement of that. He's literally going to go into that temple and tell the world that he is God. So we see that Jesus and John are telling us the same thing here, right? All right, notice what Jesus said will happen next. Jesus said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Jesus tells us that the next thing will happen is war. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Look what John says. When the lamb opened the second seal, we get the rider on the red horse. And he was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other, right? The rider on the second horse, the red horse, is war. Jesus and John are saying the same thing. After that time period of peace, we don't know how long that's going to last, but we're going to move a little further along the time frame of the 70th week. We're going to have the rider on the red horse, and that's war. Again, we see Jesus and John in perfect harmony. Look at the next thing Jesus said will happen. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Same thing John tells us. When Jesus opens the third seal, John said, the third living creature said, come. He saw a black horse. The rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. Same thing. Jesus said the next thing that will happen is famine. John tells us with the rider on the black horse, we're going to have famine. It's going to take you a whole day's pay to get a quart of wheat or it's going to take you a whole day's pay to get three quarts of barley. We're told, we're told do not damage the oil and the wine. They're going to be very rare and precious. You don't want to damage them. So again, with the rider on the black horse and with the famine, we have perfect harmony between Jesus and the Apostle John. Exactly what we'd expect if this is from the Word of God, right? All right, now Jesus said all these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus is giving us a metaphor here of a mother having birth. And Jesus said these are just the beginning of the birth pains. Well, what's the beginning of the birth pains? Well, the first three seals, the Antichrist, war, and famine. Jesus said that's just the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, things are going to get worse. All right, look what John says what happens when Jesus opened the fourth seal. We have the fourth horse, right? The rider on the pale horse. This rider was named Death. Hades was following close behind him. They were given a power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. With the rider on the pale horse, we have Death. Well, again, what I want you to notice now is we're really real close to this midpoint. Again, I can't give you exact you know, times in terms of months or days or years, but we went from a time of peace to a time of war. We had some famine. And now we have death. And you would expect famine and death to follow war. So we're pretty close to that midpoint. If we're not there, we're pretty close to that midpoint, right? And notice what Jesus said. Jesus starts talking about death. Only Jesus is talking more specifically about Christian death. Jesus said, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. So Jesus tells us the next thing is coming is death. Jesus is talking about Christian death, which happens to be the next thing John talked about, right? We're back to that fifth seal. John said, when Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. Again, I want you to see we have perfect harmony between Jesus and John. They're both talking about Christian death here at the fifth seal, right? And notice what the fifth seal martyrs do, though. This is real important. Look what they say. They cry out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Notice that the fifth seal martyrs, the Christians that are being killed, notice what they're doing. They're crying out to God and they're saying, God, why did you kill us? No, that's not what they said. They didn't say to God, God, why did you kill us? God didn't kill them. They're crying out asking God to avenge their death. These Christians were killed by the Antichrist and his forces, right? They weren't killed by God. God doesn't kill his own children. So they're crying out, how long, Lord, before you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They're crying out to God for vengeance, for 
you know, for them being killed. All right, each of them was given a white robe. They were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers were to be killed as they, as they had, been, had been completed. More Christians are going to be killed. So at the fifth seal, we have Christian death, Jesus and John, again, in perfect harmony, absolute perfect harmony. We have Christian martyrs here. This is happening probably right after the midpoint. Once the Antichrist sets himself up in that temple, he's empowered by Satan, and he starts going after the Jews and the Christians. Okay? Everybody with me? We're good? All right, now notice what Jesus said. They will deliver you to tribulation, and they will kill you. He's talking about believers here, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Well, who's hated because of Jesus' name? His followers, right? That's who's hated. Jesus said they're going to hate you because you hold to me. Now, here's one of the saddest verses in all the scripture. Look at this, verse 10. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Jesus tells us at this point when the Antichrist starts killing Christians that many people who claim to be Christians will suddenly no longer be Christian and they're going to betray one another and they're going to hate you and put you to death. Look at this. This is Jesus' words himself. Jesus says, you're going to be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. Now, every time I read that, I, I just read that almost in stunned silence. Uh, Jesus is telling us here that our own parents and brothers and relatives and friends, maybe somebody that you sit next to at church, <coughs> might betray you and have you put to death. It gets worse. Jesus said, brother will betray brother to death and a father is child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. Now, we don't like to read passages like this because they're not very comforting. But this comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. And Jesus tells us that some of us that are Christians, our own children, are going to turn us in at that time. Our own children are going to rise up against us and have us put to death. Things are going to be pretty bad here. Really bad, right? And Jesus said, when you see this, when you see the abomination of desolation, you see the Antichrist in the temple, and Jesus said, I told you about this, then he said, you better flee, because this is going to be the worst time in the history of the planet. There's going to be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, and unless those days have been cut short, no life would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. They're going to be killing Christians, and Jesus says, if I don't cut those days short, none of you are going to make it. Well, this is all going to happen. This suffering, this death and Christian death is all going to happen right here around the midpoint because we're told that that's where it's going to happen. We're told that in Daniel 9, 27, and Paul tells us what Antichrist is going to do. Let's look at those verses. Here's the passage from Daniel. This is the passage Jesus was just referring to. Jesus said he, the Antichrist, he's going to make that covenant for one week. But in the middle of that week, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. He's going to tell the Jews they can't sacrifice animals anymore. And he's going to come and commit the abomination of desolation. And again, that's going to happen at the midpoint. Daniel tells us that. It's not a mystery. And Paul tells us what he's going to do. He's going to oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God. He's going to take his place in the temple, displaying himself as being God right here at the midpoint. All right, so this is how things appear to play out. At the start of that seven-year period, the Antichrist is going to sign that peace treaty or confirm that covenant with the nation of Israel, right? Then we're going to have the first three seals. We're going to have the Antichrist, followed by war, followed by famine. And Jesus said that's the beginning of birth pains. All right, so we're up to the midpoint here. At the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to commit the abomination of desolation. He's going to break his covenant. He's going to go into that temple and declare himself to be God. And then what happens? Well, then we have death and martyrdom. Right? After he sets himself up, he's going to, there's going to be a lot of death, particularly Christian death at the fifth seal. Now notice what happens next, going back to the comparison here between John and Jesus. Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon won't give its light and the stars are going to fall from the sky. Folks, I really want you to stay with me here tonight because if you catch this, you're, going to have, you're really going to have this down. This is the sign. This is the sign that God told us he was going to give us. God told us before he starts pouring out his wrath, he's going to give us a sign. This is the sign he told us he would give us. He told us that through Joel. He told us that through Isaiah. He said the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark, and it happens right here, right? And notice what John says. John says the same thing. He's in perfect agreement with Jesus. He said when Jesus opened the sixth seal, that's where the sun, moon, and stars go dark. It happens right here. Now notice what Jesus said. Immediately. We all know what immediately means, right? It just means immediately. Immediately after the stress of those days. What days? These days. After the distress of those days, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, starts the Great Tribulation, starts killing Christians, Jesus is going to cut that short. And Jesus said, as soon as I cut those days short, that's when the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. 
And the Apostle John said it's going to happen right here at the sixth seal. Again, I want you to see that they're in perfect harmony. This just goes together like pieces of a puzzle. When we let this book interpret itself, everything just falls together like pieces of a puzzle. I see so many crazy things on the internet again. Every day I see crazy stuff on the internet where all these verses are just taken completely out of context. And as I watch these things on the internet, I think, boy, can you just open the Bible? <laughs> because when you open the Bible, it just all fits, which is exactly what we would expect if this is a word from God. We would expect it to go together in perfect harmony like we've just seen. We have Jesus and the Apostle John in perfect harmony. Let's look at the whole sequence here, back to Matthew 24. Look at this whole sequence Jesus gives us. Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, what days? These days right here. Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, that's when the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. They're going to go dark right here when Jesus breaks that sixth seal. I mean, there's just no question about that. The universe is going to be dark, right? And Jesus said, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth are going to mourn. Because they're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. When Jesus turns off the lights right here, the universe is going to go dark. Jesus tells us that then he's going to come and power and great glory. Jesus is going to light up that darkness as he bursts through with his glory. And look at the very next thing Jesus tells us, the very next verse. Jesus said, he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Jesus tells us that the rapture is going to happen right here, right? These are the words from Jesus himself. Jesus just lays this out for us. It's right there for us to see. Now, let's look at the timing again. So the Antichrist signs that covenant. Starts that 70th week. We have the first three seals. The Antichrist, war, and famine. Jesus said again, that's the beginning of birth pains, right? The Antichrist breaks the covenant at the midpoint, sets himself up in the temple, declares himself to be God. Then we have death and martyrdom, right? After he starts killing Christians, we have death and martyrdom. Now watch what happens next. Jesus breaks the sixth seal. And that's the sign. That's the sign that God promised he would give us before he pours out his wrath. So Jesus is going to rapture us here because that's what he said. He said we wouldn't face his wrath. The day of the Lord starts after the breaking of the seventh seal. The sixth seal is just the warning sign. But that's the sign that Jesus said he would give us, that the sun, moon, and stars would go dark. He promised that he would take us out before he pours out his wrath right over here during the day of the Lord. Okay? All right. So I'm going to shorten this a little bit because I've got, I need room over here. So I've got three and a half years here and three and a half years there. I don't want you to get confused, but I just needed more room on the screen. So the first three and a half years is going to be the birth pains, right? Jesus said that's the first three seals, the Antichrist, the war, and the famine. All right? The Antichrist breaks that covenant. That starts the great tribulation. Remember, Jesus said that. Jesus said when you see this, when you see him going to that temple and declare himself to be God, that starts the great tribulation. Look what we get. We get the fourth and fifth seals which are death and martyrdom. And Jesus said, if those days were not cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, I'm going to cut those days short. In other words, Jesus tells us again, he's not going to let that great tribulation run all the way for this three and a half years. Because if he does, none of us would survive. Now again, keep in mind, the three and a half years does not get shortened. That is a time period etched in stone. There's a lot of things that are going to happen over here. I'm going to show you what the Bible says will happen there. But Jesus said he's going to cut these days short. Okay? And here's how he's going to do it. He breaks that sixth seal, right? Then he's going to rapture us before the seventh seal. And then the day of the Lord will come. Jesus is going to rapture us here before he poured out the day of the Lord, which is what he said we're going to do. Now, we won't know the day or the hour, right? God tells us that we cannot know the day or the hour. We know this is going to happen somewhere in here. But again, this could be over here, could be a little further back. You know, we just know it's going to happen somewhere in this time frame. Jesus just said we can't know the day or the hour, but clearly he wants us to know that it's going to happen sometime in the second half of the 70th week, okay? All right. Now, again, Jesus is not going to let the Great Tribulation last that whole three and a half years. And he told us why, because Christians are being killed. And Jesus said, if I, if I don't cut this short, if I just let this keep going on, then more Christians are going to be killed, and more, and more, and more, and more, and none of you will survive. And Jesus said, if I don't cut this short, none of you are going to make it out. They'll kill all of you. So Jesus said he's going to cut those days short, right? And here's how he's going to do it. That sixth seal. I really am hammering this tonight because I really want you folks to grasp this and walk away with a complete understanding of this. If you understand that the sixth seal is the sign of the day of the Lord, all this fits together like pieces of a puzzle. Jesus is going to rapture us right here before the seventh seal, before he pours out the day of the Lord. Now, when is this going to happen? Again, we don't know. Jesus said we can't know the day or the hour, but he was nice enough to give us two very important clues. Look what he said. Number one, he said this. He said, for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Jesus lets us know that these days are going to be short. They're not going to last the whole three and a half years. And then here's the second clue. He said, immediately after the stress of those days, 
the sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark. All right? So Jesus gives us two very important clues that help us to understand this. Now, I know there's a lot of information there. That's why I was kind of repeating myself a little bit. And I'm so glad these videos are going to be in the Internet because you can play this back and, you know, pause this and go back and look at this. All right. Folks, we're seeing with each passing day that Christians and Christianity are coming under attack in a variety of ways. This isn't news to you. You can turn on your TV and the Internet and you see this every day. There's never been a more important time for Christians to have a biblical understanding of what God has revealed to us about the end times. And you know what I find sad? Unfortunately, many churches, pastors, and Christians will not even talk about this. The vast majority of churches will not even talk about the things that we're talking about tonight. Won't even talk about it. Most pastors won't even talk about it. And one of the main reasons why they won't talk about it is because there's still a lot of heated debate and a lot of heated emotion over the timing of the rapture. And as I've shared with you many times, we should never become angry with each other or break fellowship with another Christian over the timing of the rapture. That's foolish. There's no reason to do that. Here's why. Because good and faithful Christians hold to each of these four views. And as I've shared with you before, since none of these views can be proven with 100% certainty, we should be able to study, analyze, and critique the scriptural strength of each of these views. Right? The reality is any honest teacher will tell you that you can't prove any of these four views with 100% certainty. So it makes sense to me that every pastor and every church should be teaching all four of them and talking about the strengths of them, right? We should be able to study, analyze, and critique the strength of each view without people seeing this as a personal attack on the character or the intelligence of Christians who hold a different view. I find this so crazy. I've had pastors tell me that they don't want to teach this in their church because people get all emotional about this. And I'm like, why don't you just teach all four views? You can't prove any of them with 100% certainty either, right? So why don't you just teach all four and prepare your folks for whatever's going to happen? That's what I try to do. All right, by the way, Jesus said this, right? All men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So after 20 plus years of studying this and studying it pretty thoroughly, I lean to this view. I lean to the pre-wrath view because I simply believe that it has the strongest scriptural support. Now, I used to believe the rapture would happen over here. I'm more convinced now that it's going to happen over here, but I want to emphasize three things to you tonight. These are real important. Number one, as much as I believe that's the strongest scriptural view, I'm not dogmatic about it. I can't prove that with 100% certainty. I think the scriptures, as I've showed you, the scriptures lean heavily towards this, but I'm not dogmatic about it. And number two, I actually hope it's wrong. Here's one of the things I tell people. You know that my teaching is sincere because who would be foolish enough to stand up and teach something he hopes is wrong? I don't want this view to be correct. I don't really want the rapture to happen there. If I had my way, I'd be raptured over here. I mean, if God called me up again and said, you know, you can make this call, I'm like, let's go right here. Let's get out of here. I don't want to face the Antichrist, folks. I don't. I don't want my friends to face him. I don't want you to face him. I don't want my daughter to face him. I just think the Bible teaches that. So I actually hope it's wrong. But I don't question the character or the intelligence of any Christian who holds to one of the other viewpoints. Here's what I believe. and I really believe this with all my heart. I continue to believe that a sensible approach to the topic of the rapture is to understand and prepare for each of the four views. There's good and faithful Christians who believe all four of these views. They all have some good points. They all have some weak points. I don't understand why every church can't teach all four of these views. It seems to me that's the best way to kind of diffuse the argument. Teach all four views. Be honest, like I'm trying to be and say, look, you can't prove any of them with 100% certainty. So as a pastor, as a teacher, I'm going to teach you all four so that you're ready no matter what, right? Now think about this. If Jesus chooses to rapture us here, if Jesus chooses to gather us to himself before Daniel's 70th week begins, that would be wonderful. I'm 100% in favor of that. <laughs> if God wants to take us tonight or tomorrow, that's great. On the other hand, if Jesus chooses to rapture us here after Satan and the Antichrist arrive on the scene, then we need to be prepared to face some intense persecution. And this is one of the reasons why people ask me all the time, what's your main motive for wanting to do the end time seminar? I'm like, I want to get people prepared because if this is going to happen, and I think biblically that's probably what's going to happen, I want every one of you and your children and your grandchildren and your friends to be prepared for this because John tells us that many Christians are going to be beheaded. Now, again, we often think the beheadings only happen in places like Libya and Iraq with ISIS. No, they're coming to everybody. John said he saw the souls of those who were beheaded because they hold to the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. These are ones that will not worship the beast or his image. They will not receive his mark on their forehead or on their hands. Folks, this is coming. This is really going to happen. Satan is coming down out of heaven. The Antichrist is going to be empowered. Christians are going to be beheaded. Okay? And I'm concerned that many Christians are only being taught one view, and it's that view. 
and they're told that the rapture could happen at any moment, and they're told that they won't be here to face any of the difficulties that I just taught you tonight. You wouldn't believe how many people I run into all the time that tell me, oh, I just, you know, the rapture's going to happen here. You know, my pastor told me we don't have to worry about it. We're going to be gone. Well, you know what? If that's true, that's wonderful. We will be gone. But if that's not true, are you going to be prepared for this? I run into Christians all the time. They have no idea that they might have to face this, right? Now think about it. If the pre-wrath view is actually correct and Christians are not familiar with it, then many are going to be totally unprepared for the events that are going to unfold in that difficult time. So as I shared with you last week, one of the things I feel really good about is that I've already prepared you for this, right? Because I've already prepared you that this is a possibility, okay? Now, having said all that that I just said, for the remainder of this session, I want to share with you some additional scriptural reasons why my view has shifted from over there to over here. I want to share with you why I no longer believe in that view that I really believe that the scripture teaches this. Now, again, my goal is not to convert you to my way of thinking. That's not what this is about. I'm simply going to give you some scriptural passages to evaluate and to weigh so that you can form your own conclusion. Going back to what I said again earlier tonight, I gave you that passage from the, from the book of Acts. I want you to examine the scriptures every day to see if what I'm saying is true. I want you folks to weigh this out for yourself, okay? Now, here's what I want you to catch, too. Regardless of what view of the rapture you hold to, after all of our time studying this together, I promise you that I will love and respect every one of you, and I'm just thankful that you and I are going to spend eternity together in the new heaven and the new earth. All right? No matter if you walk out of here at the end of the eight weeks and you have a totally different view than I do, I will love you. I respect you. I will not think anything less of your character, or your intelligence, or your integrity. And I promise that I will love you and respect you. And I'm just so glad that you and I are ultimately going to end up here with Jesus forever. Okay? Now, I want to show you something here to give you something to think about. This is a book called The Popular Encyclopedia of Bible Prophecy. The general editors are Tim LaHaye and Ed Heinsohn. And I want to show you a chart in here. I want to give you some things to think about for yourself. Okay? All right, so here we go. This is from page 250 of that book. And it's a chart on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, which is what we just looked at, right? We just looked at those parallels between John and Jesus. So let me give you a little background on the chart first. You know, they've got the uh, destruction of the temple over here, and then we've got the church age. And then you're going to notice they had the seven-year period called the tribulation. Almost everyone who holds to the pre-trib rapture will call that seven years the tribulation period. And then they have the millennium over here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of things on this chart, and I'm just going to ask you to evaluate these and weigh them for yourself. Okay, so here we go. The first thing I noticed when I bought this book and read it years ago was this. Um, they said there's going to be a sign, world war, famine, pestilences, and earthquakes. And I remember when I opened that book, I'm like, whoa, um, that's not the sign. God told us he was going to give us a sign. The sign is that the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. Jesus didn't say that the sign was going to be world war, famine, and pestilence. Matter of fact, we just saw that Jesus said that's going to be the birth pains. So right away I was troubled when I opened up the book. I'm like, what do you mean the sign? That's not the sign. The sign God said he was going to give us is the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. So that kind of troubled me a little bit right away. Now I want you to notice that they have the great tribulation going the whole three and a half years. And that's not uncommon. Just about everybody who teaches you the rapture will happen here at the beginning of the 70th week they will tell you that the great tribulation lasts the whole three and a half years. And they say when Jesus said he's going to cut those days short, that he meant he'll cut it short right here, that he won't let it go past the three and a half years. Well, I just don't think that's an accurate view. I mean, I respect these guys, but I just, I think that Jesus said right in the middle of these pet verses, right? They're showing Matthew 24, 21 through 25, or right in the middle of that is verse 22. That's where Jesus said he was going to cut those days short. So I think Jesus was telling us that it's not going to last three and a half years, because if it does, we won't survive. Now, notice they have Christ glorious appearing at the end of the seven-year period. They have the seven-year period, and they say Christ coming back, his glorious appearing, is going to happen at the end of the seven years. Well, again, I just showed you that that's not really what the Bible says, right? The Bible says that Jesus is going to break through that darkness after the sixth seal, right? The sixth seal is the sign of the day of the Lord. The sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. And then the very next verse, Jesus said he's going to come in power and great glory, Jesus seems to indicate that he's going to come in his glorious appearing right here after the breaking of the sixth seal because he's going to break that darkness. And that's not going to happen at the end of the 70th week. Because if it, that happens at the end of the 70th week, we haven't even got to the trumpets and the bowls yet. So it seems like that's impossible. Jesus said he's going to break through that darkness right there. Okay, now I want you to notice right here where I put this blue circle. They've got the rapture happening over here at the beginning of the 70th week. And I want, to, I want you to notice something very powerful here. 
I want you to notice that here they have some scripture. Here they have some scripture. Here some scripture. Here scripture, 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 scripture. Everywhere on this chart they have passages of scripture except there. Folks, the reason they don't have a passage of scripture there is because there's not a passage of scripture that has the rapture there. Now think about that. If there was a passage that had the rapture there, wouldn't it have been placed on this chart? They have scripture everywhere else, but they don't have a scripture indicating that the timing of the rapture is there. I think that's pretty powerful evidence. I've shown you many passages of scripture that indicate that the rapture is over here. But again, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just here to show you some things. There are many good Christians who believe the rapture will happen there. There are many good Christians who believe the rapture will happen here. You're going to have to weigh this out for yourself. But I think that's pretty powerful that there's no passage of scripture indicated there. Okay. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is page 250 of this book. And what I'm about to show you is both interesting and troubling, I think. I'm just going to go forward one page in this book. I'm going to go forward to page 251. That's so all I've done is move up one page. And now they have a chart, and the chart is showing the parallels between the Olivet Discourse and the sealed judgments of Revelation, which is what I just showed you, right? The comparison between what Jesus said and what John said. And they have a chart here showing this. Now, I want you to notice they have the things listed here, the false messiahs, the wars, the famines, the pestilence, earthquakes, the cosmic phenomena. And then over here, they have the passages, Revelation 6, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. So far, so good. The chart looks pretty good. But I remember opening this book and looking at this chart, and boy, I was really troubled by what I saw here. Let me show you. They start with the Revelation 6 passage, and they talk about cosmic phenomena. Well, they put the passages there, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 14. Yeah, that's good. That's the sun, moon, and stars going dark. Let's take a look at that, right? There it is, Revelation 6, 12 through 14. When Jesus breaks that sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars goes dark. So that's good. So far, so good. I have no qualm about that. Six seal, there's the sun, moon, and stars going dark. So as we come back to the chart in Revelation 6, they have those verses listed there. Everything looks pretty good. But here's where I started to get troubled. Matthew 24, the chart's blank. The problem is the chart shouldn't be blank. Math, Mark 13, the chart's blank. The problem is that the chart shouldn't be blank. Luke 21, Matthew 24. Well, let me go back to Matthew 24 here. Matthew 24, there should be some verses there. How about verses 29 and 30? Let's go take a look at them. Let's look at Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. See if we have any cosmic phenomena. Here we go. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Wow. That was just left off the chart. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Very interesting. Those were left blank. They say the same thing this does, that the sun, moon, and stars will go dark. So it's a good question. Why is that blank? Now, as we come over to Mark 13, I think we have some cosmic phenomena there, don't we? How about verses 24 through 26? Let's go to Mark. Jesus said in the days after, those, after that tribulation, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. Wow. And then we're told that they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Jesus is going to break through that darkness and light up that sky. That was left off the chart. As we go to Luke 21, we have verse 11. That's good. Right, Luke 21, we have verse 11, but they left off verses 25 through 27. Why were those left off? Well, let's take a look at verse 11. This is the one they put on there. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and there will be fearful events and great signs from heaven. Well, that's good. I'm glad they put verse 11 there. But they didn't put verses 25 through 27. Well, let's go look at 25 through 27. <laughs> there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men will be fainting from fear and expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. It looks like we've got some cosmic phenomena here. Then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. All of those were left off the chart? This isn't a book that we get to pick and choose from. If we want to study something seriously in the Bible, we have to look at every relevant verse. We don't get to open up the Bible and put verses on that we like and don't put verses on that we don't like. And folks, I'm not criticizing these men personally. I'm just troubled, and I always have been troubled by the fact that those verses are not on the chart.
because they're talking about cosmic phenomena and you can't just leave them off. Now here's what gets interesting. God said the sum of his word is truth, right? I shared this with you from the very beginning. The only way you can know the truth of God is to look at its word in its entirety. That's when everything starts to fall into place. Let's go back to the chart. Um, now I'm gonna show you something really interesting here. I'm gonna focus particularly on Matthew and Mark. Okay, but I will talk about Luke again, but I wanna focus particularly on these two passages here. Watch this, ready? And Matthew and Mark, the rapture is the very next verse. But those verses don't support a pre-trib rapture. Those verses support a pre-wrath rapture. So let me show them to you and you can decide for yourself, right? They don't have any passages there. Again, I've showed you multiple passages over here. So again, you're gonna have to weigh this out for yourself. But what I wanna do is I wanna show you that in Matthew and Mark, the rapture is the very next verse. Here we go. Let's let scripture interpret itself. We're going to go to Matthew 24. I'm going to take you back to those two verses, verses 29 and 30. All right, you with me? Here we go. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus said, then they'll see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The sun, moon and stars is going to go dark. Jesus is going to break through that with power and great glory. Look at the next verse. He'll send forth his angels with the great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. We have cosmic disturbance followed by the rapture, or you could say it this way. We have the sign of the day of the Lord followed by the rapture. Exactly where Jesus said it should be because he's not, we're not going to go through his wrath. He gives us the sign of the day of the Lord. He removes us before he pours out his wrath. The rapture is the very next verse. And it was just left off the chart. Let's go to Mark, verses 24 through 26. The rapture is the very next verse. Here's those passages. In those days, Jesus said, after that tribulation, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Sun, moon, stars are going to go dark. Jesus comes back in power and great glory. Look at the next verse. He'll send forth his angels. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds. Look where he gathers them from. The farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. This is the rapture right here. Right? It's the very next verse. Verse 27. It's the rapture right there. Wow. Okay, now as we come to Luke, we also see we have cosmic phenomenon in Luke. Cosmic phenomena. Now I'm not going to go so far as to say that this passage is the rapture, but I'll show it to you because it still lines up with these passages as we go to the third gospel. All right, so let's take a look at it. It's going to be sign of the sun, moon, and stars, right? Sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. There's going to be dismay among the nations. People are going to be in fear at the roaring of the waves. Then Jesus is going to come in power and great glory. Look what Jesus says next. Jesus said, when these things begin to take place, you straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. We have cosmic disturbance following by Jesus telling Christians to lift up their heads, right? Or we could say we have the sign of the day of the Lord followed by Jesus saying to lift up your heads. Now think about it. Remember what the people of the world are going to be doing at this time? They're going to be running and hiding in the caves. But Jesus says when you see that sky open up, you don't run and hide in the caves. Jesus said you lift up your head. The reason he tells us that is because we're about to go up to be with him, right? So folks, in Matthew and Mark, the rapture is the very next verse, right? Verse 31, verse 27 right here. And then in Luke, he tells us to lift up our heads. Um, these verses don't support a pre-trib rapture. These verses support a pre-wrath rapture. Now, I'm not saying that's why they were left off the chart. Only those gentlemen would know why they were left off the chart. I just know that that bothers me when I see that because I think we need to examine the scripture in its entirety. So again, you'll have to decide this for yourself. But again, here's what I want you to see. There's no verses listed there. If there was one verse in the entire Bible that indicated that the timing of the rapture was there, certainly it would have been placed on that chart. I shared with you multiple verses that seem to indicate that it's over here. But again, I just want you to let the scripture interpret the scripture. And again, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just here to give you some things to think about. I've talked about that I'm here to put a stone in your shoe, that when you walk out of here at night, I want you to have something to think about, right? All righty, so here's the timing as best I can tell. Those first three and a half years are the birth pains. That's what Jesus said, right? The Antichrist, the war, and the famine. The Antichrist breaks the covenant. We go into the great tribulation. That's seals four and five. We have death and martyrdom. Jesus said if he doesn't cut those days short, no one's going to survive. So he cuts it short with the breaking of the sixth seal. He's going to rapture us right here before he pours out his wrath during the day of the Lord, but we can't know the day or the hour, right? So that seems to be how things lay out for us. But Jesus did tell us he's going to give us two clues. For the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. And immediately after the distress of those days, the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. So here's what I want you to see, kind of summarizing that part. 
we will suffer persecution here. As Christians, we will suffer persecution here during the wrath of Satan. And Jesus told us that. Jesus said, they'll deliver you to tribulation and they'll kill you and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and betray and hate one another, right? So we will suffer persecution here, but folks, we're not going to suffer God's wrath here. The day of the Lord is over here and we will not suffer that. So here's what I want you to get out of this part. It's really important to understand that the 70th week has three distinct periods. We have the period of birth pains. That's the first three and a half years. We have the great tribulation, which is the wrath of Satan. And then we have the day of the Lord. All right. The 70th week has these three distinct periods. Now, when we understand that, this is the key to helping us to understand all of this. It all goes together just like pieces of a puzzle. Now, I'm going to get a sip of water here, and then we're going to go to the next part of our lesson. That's pretty amazing to me. When we open up the Bible, that just all falls in place. Well, then that leads us to this question. So where does this confusion come from then? Again, we still have many Christians who hold to the preacher view, and they say the day of the Lord lasts the whole seven years. But we've already seen multiple times that the day of the Lord doesn't last the whole seven years. So where are they getting that? Where is that confusion coming from? Well... We know we don't have a single passage in the Bible that has the sun, moon, and stars going dark over there. So how could the day of the Lord start over there? How, where, where does this confusion come from? Well, several of them, or many of them, have realized that's impossible. So they've come to the conclusion that, yes, the day of the Lord has to start over here after the sixth seal. And as I've just showed you, remember, we have these three distinct periods, right? We have the beginning birth pains, which are seals one through three. We have the great tribulation starting at the midpoint. That's seals four and five, death and martyrdom. Then Jesus breaks the sixth seal. That's the sign of the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, the actual day of the Lord, doesn't start till after Jesus breaks the seventh seal. All right? So again, we've seen that the rapture happens over here. Now, again, where does this confusion come from? Where does this idea come from then that the day of the Lord is the whole 70th week? Well, I'll show you a little bit because we know it's not there. The Bible doesn't support that there. Here's where a lot of the confusion comes from. A lot of the confusion comes from because the people, the Christians who hold to the pre-trib rapture, they call this whole seven-year period the tribulation period. Now, you'll notice I have that in quotation marks again. The reason I have that in quotation marks is because you will not open your Bible and find that phrase in the Bible. There's no phrase in the Bible called the tribulation period. This is a phrase coined by men. Now, again, you're not going to open up your Bible and find Daniel's 70th week as a phrase either, so I'm trying to be fair here. But here's what happens. A lot of people that hold to the pre-trib rapture, they call it the tribulation period. And so they say the whole seven years is the tribulation period. And here's what they do. Many pre-tribulationists will take the phrase tribulation period and they will superimpose it upon biblical passages that say day of the Lord. Now, let me say that again, because that's pretty troubling. There are many folks who teach this view. And what they'll do is they'll take this phrase tribulation period. And when they open up their Bible and they see day of the Lord, they just take this phrase and superimpose it upon that. And we can't do that, right? Because here's why. By replacing passages that say day of the Lord with the phrase tribulation period, that just automatically presupposes that the entire 70th week is the day of the Lord. I mean, if you're going to call the whole 70th week the tribulation period, it just presupposes that this is the day of the Lord. All right. But that's what's led to much confusion, particularly on the timing of the rapture in particular. Right? Using the phrase tribulation period automatically presupposes that, that whole entire 70th week is the day of the Lord. Now, I want to show you this, how this was done by somebody. I'm going to show you something from a radio broadcast by Dr. David Jeremiah called The Church in the Tribulation Part 1. It was broadcast in 2013. And I want to preface this by saying I have nothing but the utmost highest respect for Dr. David Jeremiah. I just love this man. He is a wonderful man of God. He's just an incredible pastor, a wonderful teacher. I have most of his books I've listened to many of his sermons. I listened to one today when I was down at work. I had a break. I listened to one. This is just a wonderful, incredible man of God. But I'm about to show you something where David and I disagree pretty strongly on this. Okay, and again, I'm just showing it to you for your evaluation so you can determine it for yourself. Here is the teaser to that radio program. You know, sometimes when they have the radio program, they do a little teaser as the show gets ready to start. Well, this was the teaser that day. It said this. It said, the day is coming when earth enters a terrible seven-year period of judgment known as the tribulation. Well, I want you to notice right away, just in that teaser, there's an assumption here. There's a period called the tribulation, he says, and it's the entire seven-year period. Okay, and then it says, will the church be spared from it? Dr. David Jeremiah answers that question and explains why a loving God would allow this period to happen at all. 
Now, I need to sh tell you that when David preaches or when he talks on his radio show, he uses the King James Version of the Bible. At least he did for this particular episode. And in the King James Version, it's going to say Day of Christ instead of Day of the Lord. But if you have an NIV version or an NASB, yours is going to say Day of the Lord. So the passage here from 2 Thessalonians where Paul said Day of the Lord or Day of Christ. Okay, but, so you're going to see this. I'm, I'm using what David had, which is the King James Version. Now, here's what, how David talked early in the program. He said this. He said, now get this, the believers in Thessalonica thought that the tribulation period had already started and they were living in the midst of it. Well, the believers in Thessalonica didn't think that the tribulation period had started because they never heard of anything called the tribulation period. Paul didn't say the phrase tribulation period. And then he says, and Paul wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians to tell them, first of all, that they weren't in the tribulation yet. And then David says that he, talking about Paul, David says, Paul said, Someone's written letters to you or circulated letters or reports that you're in the tribulation. But see, the problem is Paul didn't say this. That's not what Paul said, right? And then he goes on, he said this. He said, Paul said, I want to beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, that you not be shaken in mind or be troubled, nor in spirit or in word or by letter, as it came from us saying that the day of Christ or the tribulation period is at hand. I want you to notice what David just did. David just said day of Christ or you can call the day of the Lord the tribulation period. The problem is that the Apostle Paul didn't say that, right? Here's what Paul said. Paul just said day of Christ. Paul did not say tribulation period. Okay, now David goes on and says this, right? He said, Paul said, he's implying that Paul said day of Christ or tribulation period. But folks, all Paul said was day of Christ, right? Now, it gets even worse in my opinion here. Watch this. And again, I love David Jeremiah, so please don't misunderstand where I'm coming from here. He says, in other words, Paul's saying that some of you think you're in the tribulation period. Now, wow, when I heard him say that, that really gave me a pause here. Look at what he says again. He said, in other words, Paul's saying some of you think that you're in the tribulation period. Folks, I can't tell you how much I respect David Jeremiah. I really do. I love this man deeply. I mean, I told you John MacArthur is my favorite pastor, but David Jeremiah is not far behind. He's a wonderful man of God. But this troubles me. When you say, when you take a biblical writer like the Apostle Paul and you say, in other words, Paul said this. Folks, there's no reason to take that and say, in other words, because Paul didn't say, in other words, the tribulation period. That's not what Paul said. And so it's never a good idea to open up the biblical writer's words and say, oh, by the way, in other words, because that causes a lot of confusion. He says, you apparently got a letter with my name on it saying that we were in the tribulation. And I want you to know that's not true. You're not in the period called tribulation. But again, the apostle Paul didn't say any of this. He goes on, he says, let's follow the argument. In verse 3, Paul said to the Thessalonians, let no man deceive you by any means. Don't be deceived for that day. Which day? The tribulation period. The tribulation period will not come until certain things be true. But folks, again, Paul didn't say this. Paul didn't say that day, the tribulation period. That's not what Paul said in verse 3. He didn't say that. Let's go see what Paul really said. Here it is. Paul said, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? That day, the day of Christ, or your Bible might say the day of the Lord. That's what Paul said. Paul said that day, the day of the Lord or the day of Christ, it won't come. In. It's not going to come until the Antichrist is revealed. So again, I want you to notice that Paul didn't say this. That's not what Paul said. Folks, we just can't open the Bible. And every time we find the passage of the day of the Lord, we can't just replace it with the phrase the tribulation period. We just can't do that. And I want you to notice this. The term tribulation period is not in the scriptures. Now, you might be thinking, boy, you're making a big deal out of this tonight. Well, I am, and I want to show you why. It's not in the scriptures. Paul used the phrase the day of the Lord. And here's what I want you to catch. Paul never used the phrase tribulation period. Paul specifically said day of the Lord. And we've already learned that the day of the Lord does not last the entire seven years, right? Folks, the day of the Lord does not last the entire seven years. There's no passages that have the sun, moon, and stars going dark over there. So we just can't say this. Biblically, we just can't say that. Now, some Christians, again, have acknowledged that's not right. The day of the Lord is over here. And I'll give them credit for saying that. But this is where the confusion comes from. Many of the teachers who teach this view, they use the phrase tribulation period. And that just automatically presupposes that this entire seven years is a tribulation period. But as we've seen, that's just not true. It's just not supported by the Bible. The 70th week has three distinct periods. We have the beginning birth pains. That's the first three and a half years. We have the great tribulation and we have the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is only some portion 
of the second half of the 70th week. It is not the whole seven years, okay? And that's, I think, what causes a lot of the confusion. So again, I just want to say that again so that nobody either here or on the tape misunderstands me. I love Dr. David Jeremiah, and it troubled me to even have to show you that because I know that looks like maybe I'm being critical of him. I'm not criticizing him, his integrity. I'm not criticizing his intelligence. I love the man deeply. I'm just troubled that I don't think it's good to open this up and say in other words. I don't think there's a reason for us to say in other words. We have to let the biblical authors speak for themselves. Okay? All right, a couple more things I want to show you tonight. How about this? Just like the days of Noah. Let's see what Jesus had to say about this. Matthew 24, Jesus said this. As it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And Jesus says that how, that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is telling us that just like it was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be when Jesus comes back. And Jesus said people were going about their business. They were eating, drinking, they were getting married until the day that Noah entered the ark, then the flood came. What I want you to notice here is the flood came on the same day that Noah and his family went into the ark. And then Jesus says, two men will be left in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Well, I think Jesus is talking about the rapture there. Now let's go to the parallel passage in Luke. Stay with me now. Jesus said, just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it's going to be in the days of the Son of Man. Notice Jesus is talking about unbelievers. He said they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage. They're just going about their normal business. And Jesus said, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The people at that time were just going about their normal business until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now, here's what I want you to catch. This is really, really, really important. We're told that the day, the very day that Noah and his family went into the ark, that's when the flood came. The flood came on the same day that Noah and his family went into the ark. Now, watch this. Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man will be just like that. In the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Jesus said on the day that Noah entered the ark, the flood came. The flood came on the same day. Now watch this. On one single day, Noah and his family were delivered and God's wrath started to pour out in the form of the flood. Now here's how good God is. God can foresee everything from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Of course, it's his word. And sometimes I just love this. Sometimes God just places a passage in the Bible and he puts a little word there or something there that just makes it so clear because it's like he anticipated that we were going to have these questions. And we see one of those right here. We're going to go all the way back to the first book of the Bible. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 7. I want you to catch this. Look what God says. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. Oh my gosh, this is so important for what we're talking about tonight. Don't miss this. Watch this. Ready? This is really, really important. God tells us through Moses all the way back in the book of Genesis, look at this. The rain fell on the very same day that Noah and his family entered the ark. Look how clear God is. Look at that again. The rain started to fall on the very same day. Noah and his family went into the ark. They were delivered. They were rescued. And the rain came the same day. God's telling us that deliverance and judgment happened on the same day. Now, what does that have to do with the rapture? Well, watch this. Ready? We've already seen that God's wrath starts over here. The day of the Lord starts over here with the breaking of the sixth seal. So you know what that means? It means you can't have the rapture over here. Because according to Jesus, you can't have that time gap. Why? Because deliverance and judgment will happen on the same day. Wow. Let's go back to that again. Jesus said that his coming will be just like the days of Noah. The flood came on the day that Noah and his family went into the ark, right? Can't have the rapture over there, folks, because you can't have this time gap. We have to have deliverance and judgment on the same day. Now watch this. Here's the sequence. The sun, moon, and stars go dark. Jesus is going to break through that darkness and power and great glory. He's going to rapture us right here before he pours out the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is going to be over here sometime in the second half of the 70th week. Now watch this. This is really important. Ready? The rapture is going to happen on the very first day of the day of the Lord. We're going to have deliverance and judgment on the same day. We can't have the rapture over here. Jesus said it'll be just like the days of Noah. We're going to be delivered. We're going to be raptured. And as soon as we're raptured, the day of the Lord will start on the very same day. Now, sometimes, again, God is so good. He says, boy, in case you missed something, I'm going to give you another example. So he gives us another example with Lot. 
Look what he does here with Lot. He says, on the day the lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone. Wow. On the very same day that lot went out from Sodom, the judgment came on the same day. And Jesus said, it'll be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Isn't that so good of God? God gives us another example here. God says, you know what? This is going to happen on the same day. Deliverance and judgment will happen on the same day. So look at this. <coughs> on a single day, Noah and his family were delivered. God's wrath started in the form of a flood. On a single day, Lot left Sodom. God's wrath started to pour, pour down and rain, or rain down in fire and sulfur. And Jesus said it'll be just like this on the day that he's revealed. Folks, at the inception of the day of the Lord, on the first day of the day of the Lord, God's people will be raptured to heaven. And God's wrath will start to be poured out on the, poured out on the earth because we've seen that deliverance and judgment will happen the same day. So I think the Bible teaches us this sequence. This week is going to start when the Antichrist confirms that covenant with Israel. That's going to start the clock ticking on that 70th week. First three and a half years are going to be those beginning birth pains. At the midpoint, the Antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation. He's going to set himself up in the temple and declare himself to be God. That's going to start a time period called the Great Tribulation. Jesus said, if I don't cut these, those days short, none of you are going to survive. So Jesus said he's going to cut those short, and he tells us how. He's going to break the sixth seal. The sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark. Jesus is going to come in power and great glory. He's going to rapture us right here before he pours out God's wrath during a time period called the day of the Lord. And the rapture is going to happen on the first day, the same day that the day of the Lord starts, because God told us that deliverance and judgment will happen on the same day. It'll be just like the days of Noah. And once again, we see that when we open this book, it just goes together like pieces of a puzzle. Folks, when we let this book interpret itself instead of letting man's books interpret it for us, when we open up this book and let it interpret itself, it just fits perfectly. And why are we so surprised by that? Mm -hmm. Folks, I believe with all my heart that this is a gift to us from the one true living God. This is inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible. This is the greatest gift we have. It's a gift from the living God and he just lays this all out for us. If we just open it up and let it speak for itself, look at this harmony, perfect harmony. All the prophecies harmonize. We have a sign in the sun, moon, and stars. Jesus comes in power and great glory. He gathers his elect. He raptures the church. It'll be just like the days of Noah. We have deliverance and judgment happening on the same day. How powerful is that? That's amazing. But that's what happens when you let the Bible interpret itself. It just goes together like pieces of a puzzle. And by the way, Jesus told us he wants to show us this. I still run into Christians all the time that go, we just can't know these things. I'm like, oh. He says we can know. He says he wants to show them to us. All right, we've got one other topic we're going to do tonight, and that's where you need that worksheet that I gave you. So you're going to need that paper that I passed out, and you're going to need a pencil or a pen. And uh, I want to preface this tonight by saying that I'm not going to collect that. We're going to do a little activity together. I promise you I'm not going to collect that. I'm not going to call on anybody. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Um, this is going to be something I'd like you to do with us. You don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to show it to your spouse, your friends, anybody. It's going to be just for you. But we're going to talk about this question. Is the rapture imminent? Because one of the biggest arguments that pre-trib teachers will tell you about the rapture happening here is they say that the rapture is imminent. Well, what does that mean? Well, they believe the rapture could happen at any time. It could happen tonight. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next week. It could happen next year. They say the rapture is imminent. They say it is certain that the Lord could come at any moment. He could come tonight before we leave this house. He could come tomorrow. That's what they believe. Now, they say there's uncertainty about the timing of his arrival. In other words, they don't know if he's coming tomorrow or they don't know if he's coming next week or next year, but they say it's certain that he can come at any moment. And then they say this. They say it's a fact that there are no prophesied events that have to happen before the rapture. Okay? So they say, again, the rapture is imminent. It could happen at any time. Now, let me show you an example of that. Again, I'm going to go back to Dr. Ron Rhodes' book. And again, I have great respect for Ron Rhodes. I have all of his books. I learned many things from him about heaven and angels and all kinds of things, but Ron and I just have some disagreements about this, so I'm going to show you some things again tonight and just let you evaluate this for yourself. So he says this in his book. He says, I must be careful to emphasize there are no signs that precede the rapture of the church. Scripture reveals that the rapture is an imminent event. The term imminent means it's ready to take place or impending. Nothing must be prophetically fulfilled before the rapture occurs, Okay. He said the rapture is a signless event that can occur at any moment. This is what they believe. They believe that the rapture could happen at any moment, okay? 
Now, again, I want you to notice he said Scripture reveals this. He said if you open up your Bible, Scripture reveals this. Okay, and what he does here is he gives us 10 passages of Scripture to look at. So on the sheet I gave you, you have those 10 passages of Scripture. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little activity tonight. And again, I'm not going to collect this or I'm not going to ask you to show it to me. Uh, it's just for your own purposes. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put each of those 10 passages up on the screen one at a time. Those 10 passages you have on your sheet, I'm going to put them up on the screen one at a time. And um, now remember what Ron said. He said, Scripture reveals that the rapture is an imminent event. That it could happen at any moment, right? He said the rapture could occur at any moment. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put those passages of Scripture up on the screen one at a time. And I'm going to read them. And as I read them, I'm going to ask you this question. Does this Scripture reveal that the rapture could happen right now at any moment? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you believe the answer is yes, if you believe that passage of Scripture teaches that the rapture could happen right now at any moment, I'd like you to circle that verse. And if you believe the answer is no, that it doesn't teach that, I would like you to underline the verse, okay? Now, when I go through these, I'm going to go through them twice. The first time I go through them, I'm not going to comment on them. I'm just going to put them up and I'm going to read them to you. And I'm going to ask you to do this. And then we're going to go through them a second time. And at that point, I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit. But I just want you to do this activity. Here we go. Ready? Everybody good? All right, here's the first one written by the Apostle Paul. And Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Does that passage teach that the rapture could happen right now at any moment? If you think that teaches that the rapture could happen at any moment, please circle it. If you think it doesn't teach that, please underline it. Okay, second one. Apostle Paul again, if anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him, come, O Lord. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him, come, O Lord. Does this passage teach the rapture could happen right now, tonight, at any moment? If you think it does, please circle it. If you think it doesn't, please underline it. Now, again, I know that later after you go home tonight and watch the video again or study, I want you to look at these in a little more detail in context because you know I'm a big believer in that, but we don't have time to go through all of them in context tonight. The third one, the Apostle Paul again. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen at any moment? If you believe it does, please circle it. If you think it doesn't, please underline it. Okay, the fourth one. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Does that passage teach that the rapture could happen at any moment? It could happen tonight. It could happen tomorrow. If you believe it does, please circle it. If you think it doesn't, please underline it. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, We're to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen at any moment? It could happen tonight or tomorrow or any moment. If you think it does, please circle it. If you think it doesn't, please underline it. Titus 2.13, While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen tonight or tomorrow or at any moment? Hebrews 9.28, a little bit longer. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those that are waiting for him. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen immediately at any time? All right, James 5, 7 through 9. This one's a little bit longer. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen tonight or at any moment? 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen tonight or right now at any moment? All right, one more passage. Jude 21. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Does this passage teach that the rapture could happen tonight at any moment? All right, now I want you to keep your sheet out so that you can look at it. And again, here's what Ron said. Ron said in his book that Scripture reveals that the rapture is an imminent moment or an imminent event. And he gave us these 10 passages of Scripture. 
And he said this, he said, the rapture is a signless event that can occur at any moment. So what I want to do now is I want to go back through those passages and I want us to take a little closer look at them. And this time I will comment on them a little bit. And again, I'm going to ask you to just evaluate these for yourself. So let's go back. Here's the first one. The Apostle Paul is writing here and the Apostle Paul said, you do not lack any spiritual gift. Well, that's good news. It's good news that we don't lack any spiritual gift. And Paul said, you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Yeah, that's true. I am eagerly waiting for him to be revealed. But folks, I have to be honest with you. I don't see anything in this passage that even remotely indicates that the rapture could happen tonight or at any moment. I don't see that at all here. How about this one? Apostle Paul again. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. Folks, seriously, I don't see anything in this passage even remotely that indicates the rapture could happen tonight or tomorrow or at any moment. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Yes, that's wonderful news. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. Yes, we're eagerly awaiting Jesus to appear. But again, I don't see anything in this passage that even remotely hints that the rapture could happen tonight or tomorrow or at any moment. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's good. The Lord is near. Okay, again, I don't see anything in this passage that indicates that the rapture could happen tonight or tomorrow. We're to wait for his son from heaven. Yes, we are. Whom he raised from the dead, Jesus. And Jesus is going to rescue us from the coming wrath. Yes, that's wonderful news. But again, I don't see anything in this passage that indicates the rapture could happen immediately tonight or tomorrow or at any other time. Titus 2.13, we're to wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we are to wait for that. But again, I don't see anything in this passage that indicates the rapture could happen tonight or tomorrow or at any moment. Hebrews 9.28, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. That's great news. And he will appear a second time. That's fantastic news. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. All this is wonderful news. But again, I don't see anything in this passage that even hints remotely at the rapture happening tonight or tomorrow. James 5, 7 through 9. Be patient, brothers, till the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Well, this one we're going to look at a little bit closer, because maybe this one's a little bit better. We're told that the Lord's coming is near and that the judge is standing at the door. And I want to focus on this part about the judge standing at the door. Now, you'll remember that several times in this study, I told you that when we want to interpret something in Scripture, we have to take the Scripture in context, and we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture, right? So if we come to something and we're not sure, these are two real good things to do, to go back and look at the passage in context and let the Scripture interpret Scripture. So here we go. I want you to notice this. Going back to our sequence from earlier, look what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 29, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of these days, the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. And then Jesus said he's going to come in power and great glory. He's going to light up that darkness, and look what he's going to do. He's going to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. All right, we're on Matthew 24, 31. Ready for this? Watch the next couple of verses. The next couple of verses, Jesus said this. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near. He's right at the door. Jesus tells us when he's going to be right at the door. He's going to be right at the door when you see all these things. Jesus said he'll be right at the door when you see all these things. What things? Well, James said said the judge is standing at the door. But notice what Jesus said. Jesus says that he'll be near right at the door only when you see all these things. What things? All those things. Let's get back to the context, okay? You'll, Jesus said, sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark. Jesus is going to come in power and great glory. Then he's going to rapture the church. And Jesus said, when you see all these things, then you know that he's near. Jesus said, when you see all these things. It's not over here, folks. It's not over there. Jesus has it over here. Look at the sequence again. Matthew 24, 29. The sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark. The universe will be dark. Jesus breaks through that darkness in power and great glory. The next verse, he raptures us. And Jesus said, when you see all these things, then you know that he's near. Jesus is going to be near when you see these things. You're not going to see him over here. So again, I don't think this passage has anything to do with the rapture happening tonight or tomorrow. It just doesn't fit when we let the Bible interpret itself. Jesus said he'll be at the door when you see all these things. Okay, how about this verse from Peter? Prepare your minds for action. That's good. Be self-controlled. That's good. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's good. 
But again, I don't see anything here that has anything to do with the timing of the rapture being imminent. And the last one, Jude 21, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Folks, again, I don't see anything here that indicates the rapture could be happening imminent. Now, I want you to look at this. And again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way to Dr. Ron Rhodes. I, I have great admiration for Dr. Ron Rhodes. I have his books on heaven and angels, and I've learned so much from him. But he said scripture reveals that the rapture is an imminent event. And folks, he gave us 10 passages of scripture to look at. Now, I've got to say this with all seriousness. None of those passages indicates to us that the scripture reveals that. None of those passages indicate to us that the rapture could happen at any moment. That was page 50 of his book. Is the rapture imminent over there? I just don't see it. On this side, I see lots of evidence that it's over here. I see that from Jesus himself, from the Apostle John, from the Apostle Paul. They all say the same thing. It all comes together in perfect harmony. Folks, I believe with all my heart that the scripture indicates to us that the rapture is going to happen over here, which means that you and I or your children or our grandchildren might be here when all this happens. And my goal is to help prepare you for that so that you'll be ready. Look, if this turns out to be wrong and we get raptured here, I promise you, I will come up to you in heaven and I will tell you I'm so sorry that I taught you this. And you're going to be so glad you're not even going to worry about it. But I feel real good knowing that I prepared you and hopefully now you can prepare some people that you love because I just think the scripture seems to indicate that. I just have this mountain of evidence over here. I used to believe that and I would like to believe that, but I just don't see it in the scriptures. I just think we have this mountain of evidence over here. I just don't see that, okay? Now, he said that um, there's no prophesied events that have to happen. Well, we do see there are prophesied events before the day of the Lord and we see the rapture is connected to the day of the Lord. We're told the sun, moon, and stars has to go dark before the day of the Lord. Malachi tells us, tells us that Elijah is going to come back before the day of the Lord. And, and the Apostle Paul said that the day of the Lord can't happen until the Antichrist is revealed. So we do have some things that have to happen before the day of the Lord. All of these things have to happen before the day of the Lord. And we've seen that the day of the Lord is connected to the rapture. So there are some things that have to happen. And Jesus, John, and the Apostle Paul all told us that. So again, I look over here and I, I just see there's a lot of evidence for that. Now let me take you back to a slide I showed you the first night. And Ron said this at the beginning of his book. He said, of the eight great debates of Bible prophecy, I'll tell you what my personal position is and why. He said, if you end up agreeing with me, that's great. And if you end up disagreeing with me, that's okay too. Well, with all Christian love towards Dr. Ron Rhodes, I do disagree with him. I just don't see what he said about the rapture being imminent. He said, after all, our commitment is to the Bible, not to a man-made system of theology, but he said this, I hope we can all learn to agree in a disagreeable way, or I hope we can all learn to agree to disagree in an agreeable way on the issues where we differ. Folks, I tried to model this for you several times tonight. I love Dr. David Jeremiah. That was hard for me to have to show you what I showed you tonight. And I have great respect for Ron Rhodes. He's a smarter man than I am. But I just don't think that what he said about the rapture being imminent matches. So let me give you my closing thoughts on the rapture. Sadly, for far too long, the issue of the rapture has been fueled by emotion. And we should never become angry with each other or break fellowship with another Christian over the timing of the rapture. What I think is critically needed is more opportunities for Christians to see the scriptural support for each of these positions laid out side by side so that Christians can evaluate the scriptures and weigh the evidence for themselves. Seriously, can you think of one reason why this can't be taught in every church? This is almost shameful. I talk to people who've been in church 20, 30, 40 years to tell me that their church and their pastor has never discussed this. Folks, this is some of the most important scriptures that has to do with the future. How can this just continually be ignored? My goal is to teach you about each of these four views and to help prepare you for the future, no matter which view proves to be correct. And again, you are all intelligent, dedicated Christians. I only want you to believe what the scriptures convince you to believe. And I want to close with this again tonight. Regardless of what view of the rapture you hold to after all our time studying it together, I promise that I will love and respect each of you. And I'm thankful that you and I are going to spend all eternity together with Jesus. I really will respect you if you disagree with me. All right, where are we going next week? Next week, we're going to look at, we're going to be in session seven. And we're going to start to look at the beginning wrath of God. We're going to start getting into the details of what God said he's going to do when he literally does start to pour out his wrath. It's not pleasant to look at those passages, but God lays it out for us in pretty graphic detail what he's going to do as he burns up this earth. And I'm going to walk you through that, what God says he's going to do in the trumpet and bowl judgments, okay? 
So that's where we're headed next week. Again, I have a Facebook page. You can find me on there. Um, I have a group called The End Times Questions, and if you want to join that group, it's a public group. You can just join it. And if you want to ask me any questions, I'll try to answer them for you. And I put articles up there that have to do with uh, things we've been talking about. So I am so thankful to you folks for coming. You've been, you made it through six weeks now. Two more <laughs> sessions, okay? You've been so uh, gracious to me, and I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next week. God bless. <laughs>